I watched this video that was uploaded recently by San Joaquin Jr. and I thought, you know, there's a perspective that's missing and it's a really important perspective. Oh, well, what perspective is that, D.B. McRae? The perspective of the police. And let me explain. When we watch videos like this, there are typically three assumptions that come into play. The first one is the police are bad, which in the case of at least one officer in this video is absolutely true. The second one is the person or persons they're talking to, they're being harassed or having their rights violated. And the third assumption is that when the auditors, cop watchers show up in scenes like this, that they're automatically deemed the hero. They're wearing the white hat and they're working to hold the police accountable and basically being an advocate for the person or persons being detained by the police. Oh, something else I want to mention is that in the video, Sam Joaquin Jr. mentions that in his opinion, the worst cops in the country come out of Arizona. And I agree with that 100%. I know that it's hard to actually quantify that, but I feel they are. And I think it's been documented that officer for officer, they are some of the worst law enforcement officers in the United States of America. So yeah, I agree with that assessment entirely. A couple last pieces of house cleaning before you watch a short segment of the video is the junior covers Houston v. Hill, which, well, I'm not even going to explain it because he does a great job explaining it. And the other thing is, once he gets done explaining Houston v. Hill, I want us to watch what El Chato Negro does when he approaches the police in this instance. So that's the combination I want to work off of when I do my analysis. Houston V. Hill and the actions of the cop watcher. Today's video is from this channel. Be sure to visit his channel and give him the credit he deserves. The video takes place in Tucson, Arizona, involving the Tucson Police Department. A couple of days ago, a man was walking down the street and noticed some parked police cars down the block. As he gets closer, he starts recording these cops and notices they are questioning someone. When the man informs the detainee that he is recording for his safety, it triggers these officers. That's when things get absolutely crazy. So, without taking up much more of your time, let's jump into the video. Holding these guys accountable, making sure they put you, bro. He's stopping your with my investigation by talking to him. And stay that far away from the phone. Don't come well, if you're going to be talking to me in a third person, you better be talking to me face to face. I'm talking to you. I'm investigation. I'm going to kill that as a munition. Then do whatever the f you got to do. I don't give a f up. You can stay on the sidewalk. Then shut up. You shut up, I'll shut up. How about that? Hey, get off the radio. You get a hold of me, I got all the evidence you need. Your films don't come out, and they come out didacted without. Plus, you guys hide them in different formats. Like, come at me with that. You can't get them for eight, eight months. Charges are already, you're already guilty by then. As you can clearly see, the main officer handling the situation is a complete hothead. Conversing with a detainee cannot be considered interference at any point. Speech in and of itself cannot be construed as obstruction, interference, or delaying, as ratified in the Supreme Court case of Houston v. Hill. The main quote referenced in this case is, Freedom of individuals verbally to oppose or challenge police action without thereby risking arrest is one of the principal characteristics by which we distinguish a free nation from a police state. Therefore, any speech directed at, towards, or in the vicinity of these officers and the detainee cannot be categorized as a criminal offense. Unfortunately, tyrants like this cop here rarely enforce the law correctly. Instead, they usually enforce feelings. Take a look at the screenshot carefully and ask yourself how many different entities are represented in just this one screenshot? How many different entities are represented in this singular screenshot? Four. Let's count them. The young man being detained by the police. Number two is the police. And number three, the cop watcher. But what's the fourth one? The fourth one is you, the viewer. Let me explain. I think the first thing that's important to establish is who has the most to lose in this interaction. Well, certainly it's number one, the young man being detained. So everything is going to be looked at through his eyes. When he looks up at the photographer who's up there filming everything, how does he view the photographer? Is it the same way that the photographer views him? Of course not. Whereas the photographer sees himself as the hero of the story, there to rescue the young man, kind of like the damsel on the tracks when the train's coming, 
he doesn't seem to understand or probably can't understand that that feeling of you know uh, kinship may not be reciprocated by the young man being detained. In fact, he may look at the photographer and what the photographer is doing with more concern than he has toward the police. The reason is obvious, and it's a pretty universal feeling. He has no control over what the photographer is going to do with that video. He has no control. He has no control over when it's going to be uploaded, how it's going to be uploaded, where it's going to be uploaded. He has no control over, you know, potential viewers. He has no control over how much editing has gone into the video. He has no idea what the consequences might be. He doesn't want people to know that he was interacting with the police. I mean, there could be a hundred different reasons. But don't just assume that he looks at the photographer as though he's a friend. This has become a case study in human dimensions. And how many of you remember your statistics? Or like one fellow I knew said, statistics. Remember that from high school, college? How many potential interactions are there in this one situation? Remember, there's four entities. Well, let's do the math or the statistics. Well, we're going to start with four because there's four total entities. And each time you pick one, you pull a number off or down. So it goes four, and then it goes three, and then two, and then one. So it's four times three times two times one. Or for the mathematically challenged, it's one times two times three times four. Now, if I'm wrong about the statistical stuff, I apologize, but this is the minimum number of potential interactions in this human dimension situation that we have found ourselves in. Okay, so it's 24. 24 unique potential interactions between different entities. Very good. Now we're going to go the other direction. We're going to start with you, the viewer. In other words, do you think the photographer cop watcher did a good job, wears the white hat, or should have kept his mouth shut and created distance and wore the black hat because of it? White hat, black hat. Now, how do you, the viewer, view the police? Unfavorably or favorably? How do you, the viewer, perceive the young man being detained? Is he a victim of the police? Is he having his rights violated? Or are the police actually acting within the scope of their authority? Do you know? Now you're starting to get an idea just how many potential human dimensions interactions are going on here. What I'm getting at is this is not a one-size-fits-all situation. Instead, we are importing a one-size-fits-all approach when we see police interacting with members of the public. It's true or false, yes or no. It is not a one-size-fits-all. It is dynamic, rapidly evolving. The matrix is incredibly complex. So how does Houston v. Hill, a Supreme Court case, factor into this? I mean, it was kind of presented as though well, you could just walk up and you could just start talking to the cops and start talking to the, the person that appears to be detained. You could say whatever you want. You can interact any way you want. It's not only your constitutional rights, but apparently you're doing God's work. I mean, unless I misunderstood something. I don't recall the information that was presented regarding Houston v. Hill as though it were limited to just one person at a time who could roll up on the police. What if two cop watchers like El Chato Negro rolled up and did the very same thing, or five or ten? What if everybody showed up and just started yelling and screaming and maybe blowing whistles and banging pots and pans? Is that your God-given constitutional right under Houston v. Hill? Just because we can do something doesn't mean we shouldn't appeal to our better nature. Do any of us know what the officers were discussing with the young man? Do we know what the officers were discussing with the young man? It's yes or no. In El Chato Negro's case, it wasn't a yes, it's not a no. It's, I don't care. I don't care what they were talking about. I'm going to do what I want to do. Because what? Houston v. Hill? I mean, is that where we are, really? Are you willing to die for El Chato Negro? Are you willing to sacrifice a spouse, a child, or a grandchild? Are you willing to sacrifice their lives in service to El Chato Negro? Are you willing to sacrifice their lives in service to a Supreme Court case called Houston v. Hill? There are people out there just like El Chato Negro who actually think not only is it their duty to crawl up the cop's ass, but get so close they can pick up the audio. They get so close to pick up the audio that what they do is basically they shut everything down and the person the police are trying to talk to will no longer talk to the police because Houston V. Hill and El Chato Negro 
What if it were a situation where the police are trying to talk to somebody who they'd been looking for the last five hours because the young man had threatened to kill his ex-girlfriend and her parents and then kill himself? What if they're talking to someone because that person might have information about a missing child? They might be delivering a death notice. What if they're talking to someone because that person has information that directly impacts you or your family? No, what if it doesn't affect your family? What if it affects someone else's family? Would you want to find out that the police were trying to talk to someone, but someone like El Chato Negro showed up and completely screwed the pooch? How many other examples can we apply in these situations? That's what I'm trying to get across, guys. This is the benefit of being a former officer. I hope it's why you're subscribed to my channel, because I want to increase perspectives and our ability to see both sides. It's not one size fits all.